fine. Really you're fine. You're fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yes, uh, today's topic is the second chapter of Zhuangzi. And it is perhaps the most important chapter. It, uh, so we, as usual, I will start with a little bit of historical background and uh, some, just some background context. But most of you have heard this uh, part uh, maybe a couple of times already. So I'll go through that very quickly. And then we'll dive into the or original text. And um, so let's do it. So the historic back, historical background, um, Zhuangzi was a philosopher from the golden age of Chinese philosophy, which is about from the sixth to the third century BC. And this period uh, was in the East, what's called the Eastern Zhou Dynasty of China. And this period can be further broken down into two uh, sub periods called the spring and autumn and the warring states periods. And Zhuangzi is from this, the later period, the warring states period. And this is really a special, very special time in Chinese history uh, during which uh, both economic, cultural, um, industrial and political revolutions were all happening simultaneously. Uh, there was a, this uh, was a feudalistic period in China and there was a lot of, it was uh, the central um, Zhou King was uh, very much weakened by now. So there was a lot of decentralization, a lot of warfare between the states to, uh, for the stronger states to, to take over the weaker states. So by this time, originally hundreds of states had conglomerated into just seven, dominated by seven states in China. And this was also the beginning of the Iron Age in China, about a millennium before the West. And um, so there was a lot of technological uh, innovations and progress going on very rapidly and the improvement of weaponry, which of course is um, a, interacts with the, with the warfare. And uh, there is uh, also a lot of uh, very rapid uh, enhancement of social mo mobility, upward mo mobility, break, breakdown of this uh, feudalistic orders, and also a lot of interstate commerce and travel. And so here's a chart that I showed last time. And this is, uh, like I mentioned last time, this is not uh, meant to be taken as some kind of uh, chart of proven uh, facts. It's a hypothetical lineage of, um, of philosophy, some of the philosopher, main philosophers in this golden age era. And, um, it's hypothetical, it's been proposed by various prominent scholars throughout history and has gained a certain foothold uh, in among Chinese scholars uh, throughout the centuries. So it's important for us to be aware of this and also it's helpful to not take it as facts, but as, as an organization of influence, mutual influences among these uh, philosophers. So Zhuangzi is in the center bottom here. And uh, the main thing for me to point out here is that he occupies kind of a special position being that he's had received a strong influence both from uh, Confucius school of philosophy and of course also from Laozi. So the, let's uh, 
going to a little bit about Zhuangzi himself, as I mentioned before, he's from a central part of uh, China at that time. And uh, he's from um, a modest uh, uh, social economic class. He was a, described as a paint garden clerk. Now this could have two interpretations. One is that he would, paint garden could be a, a the, a place name, so he could be the town clerk of the town of Paint Garden. Or maybe uh, Paint Garden really was a garden, so he was some kind of a park employee. And uh, he lived uh, circa 370 to three, three, 300 BC. And his hometown is called Meng, which was at the time of when he was born, it was part of the state of Song, and later was taken by the state of Wei, and then later taken by the state of Chu. So this is really a reflection of how much uh, warfare there was uh, going on. And uh, he was uh, written, described in history of, as a man of vast intellectual breadth, uh, but mainly rooted in Laozi's teaching. So I think his life, you know, he was really a um, microcosm, right, of the, a lot, reflects a lot of uh, the world at that time in China. You know, someone for, with a very modest means uh, had access to higher learning, to books. He was very well learned, so he must have access to a lot of books. He uh, had a very deep and broad understanding of all the other schools of philosophy in, in China and also of historical and current events. So this was typical of the philosophers on, on that time. So it makes me wonder, you know, what was the world like at that time in China? Maybe they had something like, you know, this was before TV or radios. So did they have something like um, national newspapers, for example? And people like that with modest means were able to publish their book, the, their uh, write and publish the thoughts that survive until today. So if I had a time machine, I certainly would, probably the first thing I would like to go is to go to China uh, at that time. And I, answer I some of my questions. I yes. have a quick question. Should I raise my hand or? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, but Just you, uh, uh, you, in general, raising your hand is good. Okay. Problem. Will do, sorry about that. Um, so I guess my question would be, what, what was the kind of political climate if you had to kind of describe it at the time in these locations? If... Uh, of course, uh, I, yeah, it would vary very much from state to state, locality to locality, but as a broad brush, um, it was a time of dichot a dichotomy of frequent warfare, but at the same time, people's standard of living was high. And um, so I, you know, that, that's all, uh, without getting into too much, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the book of Zhuangzi has uh, normally as categorized into the seven inner chapters and there's 15 outer chapters and 11 miscellaneous chapters. And most scholars believe that John actually he himself wrote the seven inner chapters. So let's zoom into the seven inner chapters. Sorry, I'm going to turn off my phone because the notifications are bothering me. Um, so Jason last time uh, expressed that this, this really the, the seven, which I agree with very much, that these seven chapters really uh, should be viewed as a coherent set of essays. And even if you look at the, the titles of the, the chapters, I, I think it's telling, right? The first one is Free Journey. Uh, second one is a discourse on leveling things. The third one is the essence uh, of nurturing life. Fourth one is the human world. 
First one is the manifest of being filled with the. The is a concept uh, sometimes translated as virtue. Sixth one is great master, and the seventh, seventh is should be king. So I really progressed from kind of personal liberation uh, onto bigger and bigger concepts. And eventually it uh, gets uh, somewhat into uh, the final chapter is maybe the only place where Zhuangzi actually expresses some of his views on society and government. And so today, last time we, uh, we did uh, chapter one, the free journey. And this, uh, this time um, we're getting into chapter two. And this is, um, I've always found this chapter the most difficult for me to, to understand the original text. And it's also perhaps maybe the longest chapter of the seven. So we're not gonna be able to finish it today. Uh, I've only uh, gone through and managed to translate half of it. Uh, we'll see if we even uh, finish the half, but that's okay. Wherever we leave off, I'm gonna, we're gonna pick up next time and so on. And uh, cause there's really a lot, a lot of meat to this talk. So today, Unlike um, my style before, I actually like it to be much more interactive. I'm going to do one little segment at a time. And at the end of each segment, we're going to pause and discuss and take as much time as we need to explore each one. So here we go. Sorry, I need to move something that's blocking my view. All right. I'm, I'm, I'll just start reading. Um, as the Qi of the cell side meditated behind a small table. So here is a, I took a photograph from, the dic, uh, from a, a, a dictionary of what this small table looks like. And this is the Chinese character. As you can see, the character is really kind of a simplified drawing of the kind of table that we're talking about. So the Qi was meditating uh, behind a small table. He looked up at the heavens and sighed. He seemed in a trance as if he had lost his companion. Pure companion, most scholars believe it refers to the body. So he was in the trance and he seemed to have lost his, uh, his body. Yan Chen Ziyou, presumably his student, who stood in attendance before him, said, what is this? Can you really make your body like a withered tree? And can you really make your heart like dead ash? Today's meditation is no longer the meditation of the past. So the teacher replied, has not Yan, Yan is the, the student's name, has not Yan indeed asked a good question. Today, I lost myself. Do you understand? You may have heard the wind instrument of human, but you have not yet heard the wind instrument of earth. You may have heard the wind instrument of earth, but have, but have not heard the wind instrument of Tian. So Tian, um, last time we had a lot of life discussion on how to translate Tian. And I took Kevin's advice, I just to keep it as a, a, in the original Chinese. It's often translated as heaven, but the English word heaven has so many connotations, it tends to become confusing. And Ziyou, the students said, may, may I dare to ask you the method? Ziqi, the teacher said, the great mass, so the great mass is common expression in ancient Chinese. It means earth or mother nature. He said, the great mass, mass exhales qi. It is called wind. If only it, um, sometimes it's in, inactive, but once it's activated, myriad orifices howl and rage. rage. Have you not heard it in a prolonged gale?
In the high and rugged mountains, some of the orifices in trees of vast circumference are like noses. Some are like mouths, some are like ears. Some are like vases, some are like cups. Some are like mortars, some are like puddles. Some are like ponds. Some make jetting sounds, some make sounds as, a, as an arrow leaving the bow. Some scold, some inhale, some yell, some wail, some laugh, and some sigh. There might be one leading with a yu sound and another follow with a yung sound. With a, when a, with a cool breeze comes a small harmony, with a strong wind, a great harmony. When the raging wind completes, all orifices become hollow. Have you not seen the wavering and the quavering leaf? Ziyo said, I see, Earth's wind instrument consists of the myriad orifices. Human wind instrument refers to bamboo pipes. Dare I ask about the wind instrument of Tian? Ziji said, the myriad blowings are all different and the orifices become their own with each one grasping itself. But who is the one that agitates them? So this is a rhetorical question, right? The answer to that question is the wind instrument of Tian. So I'm gonna pause here and ask everyone to invite everyone to jump in. Um, what, what is your interpretation of this first passage? Madeline. All right, I'll rush in. Uh, Great. <laughs> um, well, it, seem, it all seems quite clear. Um, I would, I disagree uh, just based on having read this this week. Uh, I disagree with your interpretation at the end um, because I think that if it's saying, dare I ask about the wind instrument of Tian um, because Tian is also a created thing in, in a sense. So I think that the one that agitates the wind instrument of it would be the Tao would be the, the Tao going through it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So what's the disagreement? I, I'm sorry, I, uh, there was something I said you disagree with. I'm not sure uh, what, which uh, statement. Oh, I thought, um, I thought that you meant that it was uh, Tian uh, doing, the, doing the blowing um, through itself, oh. I guess. But this uh, is fantastic. I the wind instrument of the Tian and I, I I think probably we actually agree, uh, but just maybe there's uh, I didn't express myself very well. The, um, uh, right, I agree with what you. I think the what I take from it is the yeah, Tian is like Tao is a driving force, and it's not a a distinct being that's separate from all the things in the world, right? It's in, it's diffusive, it's, it's everywhere, and it's whatever the force that, that, make, that make these sounds. So each, all these different orifices make different sounds. But really what the, 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 the laws of physics behind it is all the same. Uh, also, I, anyway. I, really, I really liked your word choices uh, better than the other translations that I read. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I'm glad this, yeah, that's clear. Uh, okay, yeah, anyone else? Uh, that, I, okay. <laughs> I, I think the last uh, paragraph is, uh, I think that this one is a good opening. Basics of the traditional Chinese uh, cosmology talk about the heaven, 
earth and uh, people, right? So the last one, it talk yeah. about the uh, heaven, the sound of heaven, the, the chi of heaven, chi of people, chi of earth. So basically it talk about like open, just like uh, the first uh, chapter, uh, the wandering, uh, the happy wandering, happy journey, just open a big, good opening, just open the big picture, right? The heaven, people and the earth, they all, these three are all the same. They have the sa, they have the chi, and then, you know, I think that's a, a, a good starting on this chapter. Thank you, Jason. So Alex and then Madeline. Yeah, actually, can you uh, move the slide to the very first paragraph? Yes. Um, I think, I think um, the first very paragraph is very, the first two paragraphs is probably, you know, very important in this, in this whole thing, because it really, it, because it begins from another person's perspective to look at this, this, uh, uh, this person who's meditating, okay? And the most important words in, these, in this first paragraph that I want to share with people, because in Chinese uh, 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 philosophy, the word of, of, of the, uh, by your translation, a withered tree and the dead ash, is, it became such an important concept a phenomenon for the rest of the Chinese history. It describes how uh, a person feels or how a person looks, but there's a, 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 a deeper uh, philosophy behind that. Um, I think, you know, this is a, 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 could be something like, like, even though it looks like it's a withered tree, you know, like when you go to, you know, in, 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 in New York, we have winter, right? Long periods of winter and all the trees seems to be withered, you know, and a person who come from a, a place of tropical country might not, you know, I'm, let's talk about, let's, let's say hundreds of years ago, who, who somebody who's never seen winter, when they see the trees in the winter time, they might think that the, the tree is dead, but actually the tree is preserving its energy and patiently waiting for spring to come. So the withered tree is not really withered. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very hard uh, phrase to translate. And also uh, the same goes for the dead ash. You know, it, it was, it was, it was, you can, if, if you think of it in life, you know, what is dead ash? In your, in your life, you know, when you are young, you have a lot of passion. You know, when you say, when you, you have a lot of opinions about what's going on in the world. And as you age, when you age, maybe after 20, 30 years later, that passion, that passion has condensed and have Alex, become- Alex, I'm gonna ask you to hold your thought because uh, later later in this uh, essay, probably, you, you know, um, it, it gets into that. So, so hold your thought there, but thank you very much. Those are excellent points. I do, yeah, like you said, the, the, the tree and the dead ash, I think it, it actually is a foreshadow of what's, what's to come later in the writing. Uh, anything else you want to uh, talk about, Alex? Right now, um, I think according to uh, Zhuangzi, I think what he was trying to say about the orifices, the senses, they might not be real. That's what I think. Okay, okay, Madeline, uh, you you put your hand down. I don't know if uh, you still want to speak right now or wait till later. Uh, that was actually a mistake, but I just want to, oh, okay. as long as I'm talking, I will. I just want to thank Alex. Um, I had interpreted ash as meaning the tree. Um, I didn't realize it meant ashes. So uh, seeing that it means like a tree in winter, and then maybe there are embers uh, in the dead ashes. That was really great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I cannot raise my hand. That's why I 
this one. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jason. I'd like to make a, a two point. Okay. Uh, can you move to the first uh, chapter? Uh, first, uh, yeah, the beginning. So I think that's interesting. I noticed this. You know, uh, uh, Pin's translation is uh, meditate behind a small table. He look up the heaven and sigh. He seems in the days and he lost his companion, which is the body. So the Chinese word is o o means a couple. So look like, you know, here has a dualism concept here. Okay, they have the soul or spirit and the body. So I think, I didn't notice before when I read it, but right now I noticed the words uh, Zhuangzi use is O, which means couple. So it, it's interesting, it implied the dualism concept uh, here. Uh, second, just like Alex talked about the, uh, the withered tree and the dead ashes. So, Common thing is the withered tree will grow, live again. And the dead ashes, when you see dead ashes, when you blow it, sometimes the fire will come back. So it's kind of like interest concept, you know, uh, metaphor here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tai. Yeah, um, I just want to talk about acoustics real quick. I just thought it was really interesting insofar as the metaphor with regard to the sound wind, in, wind instruments make, um, particularly going through different orifices. If you've watched the latest edition of Cosmos, which I prefer Sagan's version, but Neil deGrasse Tyson is fine too. He actually talks about uh, the acoustics of an organ and how basically the length as well as uh, the depth of the tube of the organ, you know, produces a certain kind of sound wave. Um, I think ultimately, though, what it's saying, though, is as much as we humans try to imitate nature, we really can't like and tagging on to Jason's point about cosmology, we really can't sort of like manufacture it in its totality. And recently, for instance, I was watching YouTube and, you know, just going through my you know, I'm into music, whatever. And I started listening to 8D um, uh, acoustics, which basically require you to have um, headphones on. And um, it was fascinating to me how that worked. Um, and then finally, I will say that uh, I'm a big Jeopardy fan and I, and I just saw a, a contestant who actually studies coral reefs as, as they pertain to acoustics and how that may affect um, the, the organism of the coral reef, um, the acoustics that, 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 occurs, that occurs underneath the water. Um, and so, I, I mean, I appreciate the, the metaphor and, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Ty. Right, I'm gonna try to meet myself. Uh, Alex, you wanna? Something? Yes, I, I, I think, you know, what Ty mentioned before about the acoustics and, and the chorus and, you know, it's, it, it is, it's, 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 you know, what Zhuangzi exactly want people to understand that he, he is, even though, you know, it, it seems, his writing seems, to, you know, of his story seems to be metaphorical and asking a lot of questions, but he, he is very scientific. He knows that because of the wind that makes, you know, these, these, yeah. these, you know, orifices, you know, he's a very scientific person, even, you know, and he demonstrated with these stories. So it, 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 he wants to inspire people to ask questions, investigate, you know, uh, nature and, and humans relationship with nature. But the, the second thing I really want to mention is, I, can you go back to the first slide again? I, I just want to share this with everyone. Um, because this is also another very important concept in uh, like Chinese history and philosophy, which is the, the, that line, today I lost myself. Like, think about it, today I lost myself. You know, maybe you lost yourself, a part of yourself that was 10 years ago. Maybe you lost your, you know, it's, it's, it, it could be interpreted in many different ways. But this this also is a is, is a is a pretty big topic. Um, what does it mean when you say today I lost myself? You know, um, it could mean that you lost your inspiration, your passion for something, and uh, it's a it's a it's a very new idea. Confucius would never talk about today I lost myself. You know, so yeah, I just want to share that with everyone. Thank you, Alex. Uh, excellent point. Sarah? Yeah. 
get lost. Sarah, you're uh, you're Embrace. actually we can't hear you. You're breaking up a lot. Uh, can you? Oh, can you now? I wasn't talking close to the phone. But yeah, that's better. That's better. So, with elf, I from myself to, to everything else in existence, such as here, but that. Sarah, uh, sorry, you, uh, yeah, we're, you're blanking out a lot. So uh, when you get better yeah, signal- Yeah, when uh, there's well, another human around, it always interferes. I apologize. Uh, I will follow up on that point if I can get better service. Actually, now, now you sound good. So, so maybe go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. So again, the way I saw that one line, and I do believe powerful, so I like how she just brought that up. But the way I saw it was that today I lost myself, but I gained everything else. Like for me, it's going into nature. It's like, like I lost myself, but I was with everything else. That's how I see it. But I think many interpretations, like she said, it's a very powerful statement to put in here. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... It seems like he, yeah, he's saying that he, th this meditation today, he achieved some higher state of enlightenment. Uh, I do agree with that. Um, but I, I think just like the wind, all, all the sounds are, um, are equally uh, valid. Yeah. So all the interpretations we have are equally valid. Okay, let's go on to the next, uh, next section. Great knowledge is vast, small knowledge is distinct. Big speech is scorching, small speech is verbose. When people sleep, sleep, their spirits are intertwined. When they wake, their forms open. The, when people engage, they fight each other with their hearts all day. Some are laid back, some conceal, and some secretive. Small fear is anxious, great fear is plain. They dart out as, cross, as a crossbow arrow, speaking of when people judge right and wrong. Holding back as if under oath, I'm speaking of people defending their winnings. The killing is like autumn and winter. I'm speaking of how life diminishes by the day. Humans drown in what they do and cannot go back. Closed up like a sealed letter. I'm speaking of aging into becoming a stale ditch. For a heart near death, nothing can rejuvenate, rejuvenate it. Joy, anger, sorrow, and pleasure. Deliberation, regret, change, fear, elegance, grace, elation, phoniness, music coming out of empty holes, moisture becoming mushrooms, day and night, alternating before our eyes, and no one knows where they sprout from. Stop, stop. So what do you think of this? Okay, I don't see hands up. Maybe the, the meaning is fairly obvious. Um, he's describing, I say, uh, the mundane life, lives that we, most of us live, right? We are negotiating life, learning the techniques of life, how to win in life, how to compete, how to keep secrets, how to engage, and uh, in, but in the process, we're really in the process of dying. We're in the process of uh, diminishing our true selves. And uh, eventually we age into a stale, in the state like a stale ditch. And uh, so 
at least that's my general interpretation. Karen. Um, reading it just as coming after what went before, though I don't know if it's meant to be read that way, it, it seems like after this discussion of the sounds of nature and of the tian that 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 the person has been meditating and hearing or, or reflecting upon. And then this seems like the so much chaos and noise of human life. So it's like, this is what's drowning out what we should maybe be listening to because just thinking of big speeches scorching, small speeches, speeches verbose, both of those are noisy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it seems like there's a lot of, there's a lot of activity here. Um, yeah. It's going nowhere but towards death. And, and so it's sort of like, you know, there was all the noise of the previous one, and now there's a bunch of noise here. So I just, I hadn't really until now noticed that, you know, it's, it's more talk about noise in a way, right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, as long as you guys can hear me, quick question. Um, what was the, the main thinker's um, take on everlasting existence? slash does do i mean do they believe that we just age and die or do they believe um that we kind of continue with our souls and it's everlasting in that sense i think that's a it's an important um i think thing i need to know about this and i just haven't been joining your classes enough so i don't know if you guys have already gone over that topic but what's what's kind of the general take on that in this in this kind of area and timing uh, yeah, excellent question. And you, you saw the me answering. I think there's a there's an answer uh, in a few later on in a few slides. How about that? And and, and I'll see if uh, at the end, if you don't think you got the answer, then then ask me again, and I'll I'll try to elaborate. On that. Okay, thank you. Okay, sounds great, Alex. Alex, are you mute? You're muted. If you're so, yeah, to I think I think uh, I uh, yeah maybe later uh, we're, we're probably going to get to that point. But I want to point out uh, to share this with everyone that that this essay, this um, this whole essay, this chapter has a lot of comparison. This is how John Z writes when he wrote. He loves to compare a lot of things like big and small, knowledge, speech, what kind of speech. You know, so I just want people to keep that in mind that, you know, it's uh, it, it, it makes you think about many opposite things and, and what is right, what is wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's move on. Once obtained, will it give life again? Without these things, there is no me. And without me, there's nothing to get. This is indeed close to the matter, but we don't know what governs it. If there is a true ruler, I am singularly not able to see it. The operability is already affirmed, but I cannot see the form. The context exists, but no form. The hundred bones, nine orifices, six organs all exist. With which should I be intimate? Do all of them please you? Is there a coveted one? Are they servants and maids? If, if they are servants and maids, then they are not sufficient to govern each other. Do they take turns as ruler and subject? Does a true ruler exist? If seeking, obtaining the true essence or not does not add or diminish the reality of truth. Once a body is formed, we do not escape waiting for it to finish depleting. Going against and along with things, the progression toward depletion is as a chariot in motion and cannot be stopped. Isn't this tragic? Whole lives toil, toil without seeing success, tired from exhausting toiling, but not knowing where to return. Is it not pitiful? People say this is not dead, but what is the benefit? The body evolves and the heart follows. Is this not a great pity? So, 
Any comments, thoughts to share? Uh, Madeline has hands up. Um, Madeline and then Tai. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just thought I would get things going. Um, I loved the uh, the listing of the parts of the body, the bones. Like it's very specific using the numbers. That was lovely, and um, also as um, servants and maids. So what he's really saying is. Um, is this a um, like a self-sustaining network system that we're in, or uh, is there something that is outside of it directing it? Not just the body, but um, the entire universe. And he, he sort of encapsulated the whole question in this one little paragraph of metaphors. Yeah, personally, I find this paragraph is, is one of the most thought-provoking ones for me. He doesn't give us the answer, right? But when you think of your own body, what is the master? You know, is it our brain? Is it our heart? Obviously not any one of them. Is it the collective? Well, that doesn't quite seem like it either. Is it, is it that there's something else called the soul? I don't know. Uh, yeah, and, um, and also he says, um, whether you, basically the last sentence of that paragraph, I interpret as saying, um, it doesn't matter how you understand it. Um, yeah. it's, going to, it's going to be what it is. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ty. <clears throat> uh, I just have a informational question, like, um, I counted two eyes, two ears, one mouth, two digestive orifices. That just adds up to seven. And so <laughs> unless we're going with where soul meets body, uh, <laughs> I don't, um, soul and heart, I don't know. But if anyone knows the answer, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I thought about that because in Chinese only we say seven orifices. Because, uh, you know, but then I realized we're only thinking about the face. You're not thinking about what the, the person was drawing on our screen before. That's another orifice. You and know what? Behind, you know what? Madeline got it right. It's the totally the one. nostrils. The yeah. nostrils. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah. Two nostrils, two ears. So there's two, four, five, six, seven, and then plus two more. There's nine. And then that why is it six uh, organs? Because in Chinese, we never really say five organs, but it's actually there are two kidneys. So it's, it's six. <laughs> OK. Yeah. I uh, yeah, again, I, I like to look at the, the, the last sentence, right? Uh, compared to the beginning, uh, you talk about the couple. Uh, so I, I keep looking, I keep reading this one as a dualism uh, idea. So he talked about the heart, the shape, uh, the body evolve and the heart follow. So basics are talking about the couple, the dualism, the heart and the body. So here he complained about it's a pity, your heart follow your body. So in another yeah. way, if you can have your heart lead your body, that would be the different situation. So that, that's what I read in uh, this uh, paragraph. Yeah, thank you, Jason, great point. Also, you know, you, another parallel is the first paragraph, right, uh, talks about all the different sounds and then it ends with a question. What agitates, what, what drives all these sounds to be made? And here also, uh, he writes about these different parts of the body I answer with a question. Who is the, what is the true ruler of all these different parts of your body? And okay, let's keep going. Is human, is human life as blind as such? Wait, sorry, I'm making sure I didn't skip anything. Okay. Is human life as blind as such? 
am I alone blind? Well, there are ones who are not blind. If we follow our made up mind as our teacher, who will alone be without the teacher? How do you know if someone who replaces what is in your heart with his own has the truth? A fool might be able to do that. With a mind yet to be made up and to have judgment of right and wrong is like departing for the state that we are today and arriving yesterday. This is to regard non-existence as existence. Even if Sage Yu were here, he cannot know. What am I supposed to do? So any, any thoughts on this? Um, I'll make a quick comment. I, I, I can't raise my hand. Uh, so, I mean, I look yeah, at this. Yeah, jump in. Uh, so this has to deal with uh, do with uh, just uh, uncertainty. Um, like there, we, we just don't know what the right thing to do is in a particular situation. That's the way. I kind of just yes, comment. yes. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Yes, thank you. I want to make a comment about Qi Sui, Sui Qi Cheng Xing Er Si Zi. We, yeah, we basically translated uh, we with the mind we made up we judge everything we we own. That's so basically what our mind, what our knowledge. We learning more, we have more cognitive bias. So many. If we search yeah. to key is then another we with a cognitive by uh, cognitive bias, then you going to either fall into the trap of false dichotomy. Yeah. Yes or no, you know, gonna judge people, judge the uh, ideology, uh, judge a person, judge a behavior judge everything you can sense and we but one thing you don't judge yourself thank you i'm gonna pause here thank you thank you kevin and elena elena you muted uh okay. yes um yes i unmuted myself and thank you uh, i have uh, one comment and one question my question is, who is, um, what do you think, who would be a sage you who, um, who has been referred here? It's one thing. And my comment is, here's like, um, it's an it's, um, inquiry into, uh, am I the only one who has made up mind? And are there others who, who say, um, quote unquote, who, who did awake and uh, do not have say pre-programmed mind that rules them. That's how it just, I interpret it again. It's just an yeah. inquiry. I, the only one like that, but others are like that too. And if they are not like that, then what? Right. <laughs> so, right. kind of that, yeah, thank question. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to answer your question, you, you, the sage who was the founder of the Xia dynasty, which was two dynasties before uh, Zhuangzi's time. Uh, he was known as, uh, at the time there were horrible floods by the Yellow River. Uh, he led people and uh, dug, he came up with a strategy of digging channels to uh, redirect the flow uh, into the ocean and relieve the flood that way. And he, he solved, uh, he stopped the floods uh, after working tirelessly for many years. So he became very ce celebrated as a, uh, a cultural hero, a savior, if you will. Uh, okay, SK. Hey, uh, <clears throat> this kind of reminds me of uh, Katok Nishad where uh, we talked about how mind takes over the horses and the chariot goes nuts, uh, the, cha the whole chariot goes nuts. And also the, the orifices that uh, you talked about earlier, 
there is a similar thing in Mandukya Upanishad, uh, which we kind of touched upon very briefly. Uh, we haven't really gone into it. Um, but uh, yeah, here the mind kind of reminded me of that, uh, where the mind has taken over the chariot and the senses are just driving you all over the place. Thanks. Thank you, SK. You actually, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it made me think of the whole um, initiation of uh, Zen Buddhism in China. They certainly, Zhuangzi has had a lot of influence. And you can see why, you know, it's almost, in, Inevit inevitable that once Buddhism came into China, there's these kind of commonalities. You know, reading one makes you kind of think of the other, and, and it's kind of a natural thing that this something like Zen Buddhism will be born out of this. Uh, yeah, but, but I, think, I think ultimately, I think there is one. You know, there's one truth, right? I mean, we always say that, um, and there are different paths. You know, if you took it look at Judaism or Christianity or, you know, most of the time the really reached soul, when you hear them, there is a lot of similarity that you can draw between them because it, that ultimate goal that they have reached is kind of similar. Anyways, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hand, so I will uh, proceed. Now, language is not wind. Language has something to say, but what it says is not settled. Is there really something to be said? Or was, it, was there never anything to be said? We take words to be different from birds chirping, but is there really a distinction or is there no distinction? Wherever Tao is obscured, truth and falsehood arise. Wherever language is obscured, judgmentalism of right and wrong arise. No matter where Tao goes, it exists. No matter where language exists, it is suitable. Tao is obscured by small accomplishment and language is obscured by prominence and celebrity. Therefore, Confucianists and Mohists have their rights and wrongs. Writing what they hold as wrong and criticizing what the opposition holds as right. If one wants to right the wrong and wrong the right, then there is nothing like using Ming. So Ming is a jargon that he created to try to um, represent this concept, some kind of philosophy he's trying to tell us uh, in, this in this paragraph and the next couple of paragraphs. And the word Ming itself means brilliance in Chinese. So yeah, uh, please don't be shy to raise your hand, but uh, Madeline. Okay, I'm not. Um, I was just wondering, so in the penultimate sentence, uh, therefore Confucianists and Moists, um, is he, he is, so he's a later Taoist, he's coming in after the Confucianists and Moists, he is agreeing with rectification of names, but he is saying that um, it has to come from that place in the center uh, rather than from uh, ritual and everything and custom. Are you asking a question or is that your interpretation? It's my interpretation. I'm wondering uh -huh. if it's correct. So it's also a question. Yeah, yeah, you raised a really good point uh, and some insight that I have, hadn't thought of before, because um, I think you're right, because later, right, he, he talks about the, the pivot of Tao and being the center and uh, in the center of the circle of argument. So I, I, I agree with you. And, and that's, uh, you know, when I first read the, this, uh, this paragraph myself, I thought it was a simple critique of this uh, useless argument between different perspectives and different schools of thought. But yeah, thank you for, I think you, your, uh, you know, your insight into this uh, so, as a, gave me, a, gave me a, a better level of understanding. Uh, Alex. Uh, yeah, I think, 
I think this paragraph makes me uh, think about a lot of um, opposing, um, opposing um, um, arguments in the world right now. Um, and that, you know, uh, we should listen to, always listen to what everyone has to say and not just uh, think, think of everything in terms of, in terms of right and wrong. Um, yeah. That's the equality of things. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, is uh, th this previous paragraph and this right? He he's trying to really make make us induce us to question ourselves. Is there really right or wrong? Is there even such a thing as opinion or or message? Like, is, does language really contain anything meaningful? <laughs> right? He he really wants to fundamentally completely ask us to question everything. Uh, Karen. Yeah, I I. I'm kind of uh, caught by the the idea that language creates truth and falsehood as well as right and wrong. So it, it seems to me, if you think about language as sort of like the chirping of the birds, that it creates these it creates these problems for itself, right? So you know, because you have you start to put things into words, and the words are sort of limiting when you describe the world in terms of one you know, you obviously don't capture everything. So someone else will come and describe the world in terms of its opposite. And the truth is somewhere in between if there is truth. <laughs> um, and so you're kind of setting up this back and forth, but in the end, it may just be that you're creating this whirlwind in a teacup of your own, you know, creation because you come up with these concepts that then play off each other. Um, and in the meantime, there's just existence in the background, just going along doing its own thing. Um, so yeah, um, you know, so one side is just criticizing the other and they're going back and forth like birds chirping at each other. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, the opposition and it's continuous back and forth is created by the conceptual framework that they've created in order to get the conversation started. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Karen. So I see someone in the chat box asking what is Dao? Uh, yes. So Dao in, is a character in Chinese that means the way or the path. And is really, it's, it's a concept that's hard to explain. Um, it's kind of like how the cosmos works, uh, something like that. So it's, a, it's an abstract concept, uh, the way, yeah. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ping. Uh, I got two points. One is about the Dao. Uh, if you base it Dao the Jin first, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chao Dao, it's generally all the days, they don't have punctu punctuation. If for today, if I can interpret, I'm going to Dao uh, can be spoke, Dao cannot be spoke, all eternal Dao. That's basically for apply to our own life. What do we know? What we don't, don't know, all apply to Tao. It's not, uh, see, what I know is Tao. My way is highway. Another way is not. So I, I can pause there. Another one about it here is language. Language itself, if seen language as a tool or system, it always have so many limitations. It's linear. It's uh, uh, judgmental. And if we want a concept apply to another language system, maybe different, for example, Tian, apply to a, a Western language, it's hard to interpret. And from, for example, we apply heaven to the uh, Chinese, we easily sound it. It's different to what we, you know, if it's, it's interesting thing, when we do translation, one side, it seems to make sense. If it's trying to back, totally different. Basically, it's really like a deal. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Alex. Yeah, I think Joe, Joe, did you raise your hand? Oh, Joe, yes. Uh, yeah, I, he can't raise his, his hand. So yes, uh, please. I, I, I did, but it, uh, that's okay. Um, okay. What I was going to say, I would, yeah, it's no problem. I did. Thank you, though, Alex. Um, so yeah, Alex, actually, go ahead. yeah, actually, I want to I want to give an example of Dao. 
Okay, and it, it could be a little bit different from what previously uh, discussed. Basically, Tao is, for example, a cook, you know, where you see uh, uh, in, a, in a night market in Asia, you know, they do everything very quickly. They have been doing the same thing for maybe 10 years. You know, the ominous, you know, motions of how they make the noodle, you know, and put the different ingredients in, that is in, that is in a way a kind of meditation. And, and that actually refers to the very first paragraph where the meditator is trying to meditate. And um, basically, when somebody has been doing the same thing and, and have, have so evolved themselves, have learned so much, have morphed, basically morphed themselves into what they are doing without thinking, and, it, and everything becomes, you know, they don't even have to think about it and they already know what to do. You know, just like, as you know, many of you people probably know, a Japanese sushi master, they have to practice for 10, 15, 20 years to become a true sushi master, you know, every day doing the same thing. And that is a form of dead, uh, a meditation. And when, when they finally achieve the truth, you know, when they finally don't even have to think about it, they already know the secrets and essence and more of it, all that experience, you know, actually, the they call it this this chapter is is also talking about a lot of, a lot about experiences in life. So this this you know, person who's been doing, you know, something for a long time, you know, is in the end is a, he will achieve Tao, which is, which is, he doesn't even have to think about it. And that is already, you know, he already know exactly what to do. Um, so that's, I just want to give that example. Thank Great. Thank you, Alex. So let's, uh, uh, let's move on. There are no things that are not that. There are no things that are not this. From the perspective of that, we do not see. When we know for ourselves, then we know it. That originated from this, and this also came out of that. That is the saying of just born. So just born, he's referring to another philosopher's famous theory. Uh, that, so, uh, and, and now he explains, summarizes what that is. Birth is the beginning of death, and death is the beginning of birth. So, Sarah, uh, when I said uh, there's an answer later, uh, this is the, the section that I was thinking about. So, birth Perfect. is the begin <laughs> beginning of death. It's like hits, death it, hits the nail on the head perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And death is the beginning of birth. Affirmation is the origin of re rejection, and rejection is the origin of affirmation. Because this, there is right, wrong exists. Because there is wrong, right exists. Therefore, the sage does not follow, but reflect on Tian also because of this. This is also that, and that is also this. That has a right and wrong, and this has a right and wrong. Is there really a that and a this? Or is there actually no that or this? That and this never obtaining their counterpart is called the pivot center of Tao. So just to uh, also add a little bit, Sarah, uh, basically the Taoist view, especially Zhuangzi's view, is that life and death, it's just all a part of the cycle of nature. And what we think of uh, life, you know, the beginning of life is really also the beginning of the march toward death. And then the, what we think of the beginning of death is actually the birth of the next life. Just like a dead leaf that falls from the tree, go into the soil and become nutrient to grow more tree. Right, yes, that does that does very much answer what I kind of wanted to know. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, everyone, what do you think?
or I can move on. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. I have two more slides. Uh, we have 11 minutes left. So I want to get to, definitely get to the, the story of the monkeys, which is my favorite. Uh, probably just because I like monkeys. Uh, and then and then we'll we'll wrap up today. The pivot begins by acquiring the center of the ring to respond to the endless. Right is an endless, and wrong is also an endless. This is why I say nothing works as well as using Ming. Using a finger to show a finger is not a finger. So again, this coming of the finger and the horse is he's referring to the, the school of names, philosophers, uh, endless debate about whether a finger is a finger or if a white horse is a horse, uh, stuff like that. So this, it's, a, it's a cross reference. And if you don't understand this part, I would say, don't worry about it. it it's, uh, so using a finger to show a finger is not being a finger is not as good as using a non-finger to show a finger is not a finger. Using a horse to show a horse not to be a horse is not as good as using a non-horse to show that a horse is not a horse. Tian and earth are but one finger. All things are but one horse. Affirm the affirmable, reject the objectionable. A path is made by walking. Things become so by being called so. What is so? Whatever is so is so. What is not so? Whatever is not so is not so. And I, you know, my meager understanding, basically the main point is, you know, all this, all this arguing between different philosophers and whatnot is just endless. And, you know, things are just the way they are and it is what it is. And things definitely have their way of being so. Things definitely have their fit. There is nothing, there is nothing that is not so, nothing that is unfit. For instance, a stalk of grass and a pillar a leper and Shishi, Shishi was uh, uh, the most famous uh, beautiful woman of that time. It's an epitome of beauty in Chinese history. So a leper and Shishi, uh, all the mysterious and bizarre beings, Dao arrives at one. So basically to Dao, it's all, it's all the same. They're just things. That which is partial is completed. That which is completed, degenerates. For all things, there is no completion or destruction. They return to one. Only the wise understands the return to one. Therefore, the wise does not use judgment, but resides in utility. Utility is using. Using is to unblock. Unblocking is to obtain. This brings us closer to the truth. Based on this, when one stops without knowing how so, is called Tao. So this reminds me of two things. One is what Alex just said. She's describing someone be become so skillful without even knowing how to do it. You know, you forget how to do it because you no longer think about it. You just do it. You just know how to, you know, your body just moves. And another thing is uh, this thing about utility is a famous quote from Deng Xiaoping. Uh, when he was a leader, the, the leader of China, there was a great debate on the path forward, whether it's going to be communism or capitalism. Uh, he famously settled the, the fierce debate by saying, we don't care if it's a black cat or a white cat. A cat that catches mice is a good cat. So, Karen. Um, that's, a great, that's a great quote. Uh, it's, is there a criticism here of the whole um, project of rectifying names? Um, because it, it seems to me that um, he's not being a sort of uh, deep skeptic or relativist in that he thinks that there is a way reality is, right? Um, but, you know, a, a, a stalk of grass could be like a pillar to an ant or, you know, someone who's very beautiful uh, or someone who's a leper might be very beautiful to some. Um, so, so it's like our names can't fit fit the complexity of reality because they're always going to come from one. They're always going to come from the one doing the naming, right? So, um, so I, I'm wondering if there's sort of just a rejection here of that project of the idea that you could rectify the names, right? Because 
the names are names are tools. And so I'm, I'm wondering if here is it and is it uh, Cheng? I, I tend to I tend Chang to Zhe? agree with. Yeah, is know, it? I, I tend to my own term. I, I I agree with you. Um, and you know, it's about names. Is this this endless circle, right? Mm -hmm. And why does it keep circling? Because it's insufficient. Whereas, whereas Dao, Dao is not inside the circle at all. You know, right. the circle is a one-dimensional being. The Dao is really outside of that dimension, and it's right. in the middle somewhere. Right. Or you, um, or you could imagine like a group of kids at at uh, um, at an elementary school trying to figure out who the real grandma is because everybody calls a different person grandma, and they just don't understand how that word grandma works. <laughs> right. So, right. so, so. Yeah, so it's like he's saying, you know, you you have these names like right, wrong, beautiful, and they're kind of like grandma, right? They're kind of yeah. in relation to you. So if you're if you're if your life if your intellectual quest is trying to find the right the, the one truly only grandma, you kind of miss how language works in that in, right. when it comes to grandmas, right? Grandma for you is different from grandma for Susie next to you. Um, and so I'm wondering if he sort of almost becomes the first pragmatist here of of sort of saying, you know, when it comes to language and truth, the best we can do is what works uh, because we're always gonna be like, you know, we, we wanna use grandma so that we get to the woman who gives us cookies and takes us home after school or whatever, you know, like we want the, we want to be able to use grandma in that spirit, not thinking we're on this quest for the true grandma of all humans everywhere, right? Yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting points. Alex. Yeah, I see. I just want to give a, another short example of the Tao. Uh, it's you know like the sec the the first line that you're talking about. Things definitely have their way of being. So so basically, it's 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 just like a tree. You already know how to grow to be a tree, a flower, or an animal, uh, uh, a a leopard, or or or, or the uh, uh, the epitome of beauty. She she you know she you know she's just going to be the way she's going to be, and everything else you know in nature already know how to you know nobody nobody need to teach them how to do these things. So mm -hmm. in the end, that is all Tao. Yeah, just want to yeah. add that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Elena. Um, okay. Um, so just going there again, what do you think um, is um, so, oh, something that I picked up? And let me phrase a question. So there is um, once there is uh, two sides with a counterpart and um, they are identified, they disintegrate, and they don't return to Tao. Whereas there is some, some particular elements that are not complete, they return to Tao. And there is, this is uh, for all things for which there is no completion and destruction, they return to Tao. And um, uh, in the previous, previous uh, chapter we had um, um, for all these things they do, that don't have counterpart um, they also call the private center of Tao so what is that what do you think is happening here thank you yeah I, I think everything is inside Tao so um, he's trying to say, yeah, we see the world often as dichotomies, right? The life uh, and death are opposite things. But there's, but when, if you understand Tao or from the Tao's perspective, they're actually just the same thing, is that things transform. They're not actually opposing. Is life transform into death? Death transform into life, life, and so on and so forth, and never ending. So that's uh, that's why uh, that's what he's trying to say is that Tao. So we uh, humans tend to see things as these opposing things, dichotomies, and uh, things. Uh, there's a right or there's a wrong. But it's actually not about any of that. There's only a right 
you will only think that something is right because you think something else is wrong. So without wrong, there's no right. And with no, without right, there's no wrong. So everything is interdependent and everything is transformative and evolutionary. And uh, so that is the one that, uh, that, that Tao understands. Uh, Madeline. Uh, I'm looking at the last few sentences. Uh, for all things, there is no completion or destruction. Return to one. Okay, here we are. Therefore, the wise does not use judgment, but resides in utility. I'm wondering if the utility and using um, refer to everyday life. Um, like, I know a couple of times in the Tao Te Ching meetup, um, Aman has said that it's uh, the Tao Te Ching is kind of a is kind of a, a manual for how to go about life. Um, and so I'm wondering if the, it's if it's that kind of utility of daily life, or it's um, if it's the practices like say um, Tai Chi or, or Qigong or something that are the things that are going to be useful to you in getting uh, becoming more enlightened. It's probably both, but I I think it certainly does include the everyday utility. Because I think of uh, in Dao De Jin, uh, Lao Zi, uh, there's uh, a chapter that says, a house is hollow inside, and that's what makes it useful. A uh, water vessel is hollow inside, and that's what makes that useful. And uh, you, you have 30 spokes to form a wheel and it's, it's uh, hollow in the middle, and that's what makes it useful. And then it concludes by saying, the existence of things is necessary, but what makes it useful is the hollowness. Um, so I, you know, knowing that Zhuangzi is a, a great admirer of Lao Tzu, I, I, I would uh, think those, uh, they use the same words, and so I, 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 I kind of use Lao Tzu to interpret Zhuangzi here. Um, Alex, actually, if you can wait, we have just one more slide, so, and uh, we're a couple minutes past time, so I'm going to just read uh, the next slide, and then, and then we'll, we'll go into discussion, okay? Thank you. To tire one's mind in the effort to understand one, yet not knowing that they are already the same, this is called three in the morning. What is the meaning of three in the morning? So he's referring to an anecdote. When the monkey keeper was handing out chestnuts, he said, three in the morning and four in the evening. All the, all the monkeys were angry. He then said, well then, I'll give you four in the morning and three in the evening. All the monkeys were pretty pleased. The name and substance did not wane, yet the happiness and anger came into effect. It is because of this. Thus, the sage harmonizes right and wrong and rests on the scale of 10. This is called dual path. Okay, so now we're basically, we are halfway through this chapter. And this is uh, where we stop today. And um, in uh, hopefully in the month, we will pick this up and finish the, the chapter. Thank you. And uh, yeah, please, we're open for discussion. Alex. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Um, your translation of three in the morning is correct. <laughs> How did you arrive at translating three? Because Zhao San Mu Si is not just, I, I'm not sure if it's just referring to, to, the, to the time of the day. I think it, 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 it ref, it's referring to quantity. Oh yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, sorry, I didn't think, uh, you know, it didn't occur to me that's ambiguous. It's uh, three pieces in the morning, yeah. I should have oh. said, yeah, thank you. I should say three pieces in the morning, yeah. 
three pieces in the morning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or three chestnuts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. this this yeah. is this. You know, I just want to share with 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 the with with people in this. Uh, so Shasta. I thought it would be clear because because the you know it refers to the story and the story is about three uh, three chestnuts in the morning. Yeah, it's a, it's about somebody a, a, or a group of people. You know, um, they they're having three, but they're still thinking about four. Like they're never satisfied. But then if you reversed it from four and then to three, then they feel they all of a sudden they feel like they're getting more. You know, even though it's the same thing every single day. So it's referring to people um, as, you know, a lot of people nowadays who are arguing for, for, you know, how to go about, you know, different things, how to manage different things. But actually, maybe they're all the same. It's just how you administer it, you know. So, so this is referring to people who are, I guess, in a way, a little bit greedy, you know. So, um this is a very famous story in, in Chinese history, and this Zhao San Mu Si is used a lot, even today, you know, like you already have three, but you still want to have more. You already have, a, you know, a good amount, and yet you're not satisfied, and you still, still want more. Um, but actually, in the end, it could just be the same thing. Yeah, into, yeah this, is, this is a uh, common uh, four-character idiom. That's a uh, very well used in modern day language. And it also refers to when you describe someone who's fickle. And, and like you said, Alex, that, that fickleness that's driven you know, oftentimes by greed or wanting more. But someone who, who you can't count on because this person keeps changing, you know, changing his mind, you would describe that as uh, morning three and evening four. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, today when we say Zhao San Mu Si, I don't think most of people think about the monkey eat three and, and in, the, uh, in the morning and the four in the afternoon. I, I think most of people think about like an indecisive person or fickle, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, situation. Yeah, yeah that's the, 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 the story is from here, but uh, after 2000 years, people change the meaning. Uh, of this. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about is up to this point, uh, I just want to bring to a little bit high level point of view, right? You can see at the beginning, uh, Zhuang Zi talk about the very big picture, the heaven, the sound of heaven, the earth and the, the people. And they start to move the knowledge, right? The great knowledge and the small knowledge. They move to the mind and the body or so called body and the heart. And they talk about the right, uh, right, the wrong thing, wrong, the right thing, and what's the judgment? And talk about the uh, moism and the Confucius, the argument that they debate and the, the, the criticize each other. And we all use language, use different language. And what's the difference between our language and the, the birth song? They keep asking this kind of question. They start to talk about the birth and the death. Are they the same? The birth is the toy going moving forward to the death. And the, when you are, the death is the beginning of the birth. So then talk about, go back to talk about the uh, heaven and the earth. Uh, it's just like a horse. What's the difference? When you point about everything, you can you use your finger to point out the everything. It, it's just a finger. So I think they try to lead on like, Everything is the same, you know, what's the difference? And I think that's the concept is quite simple, but uh, <clears throat> that, that's the way Zhuang Zi try to bring uh, the whole essay, you know, about uh, this one. And then what next, the, the second half will be more things like a butterfly, you know, so that, that's leading to the end. So I, I, I see this one, the language is quite difficult. I, I, this, even today, I read many times. I still find a lot of words are very difficult. So I, I also like to ask Pin the question, how do you read the last two words, the dual past, the okay? I, I still don't 
get it. Okay, I don't know. You have a better explanation. I don't get that. You know, the Yi Ming and Liang Liang Hang. I I just uh, I just assume that this is a new concept that uh, Zhuangzi was trying to introduce, or his original concept. So he's giving it his own terminology, and he said, "No, that's why he says this is called Liang Hang." Uh, he's he's basically in, in coining his his own his own terminology to represent this concept. Kevin? Yeah, I like the Zhou San Mu Si. Totally seven pieces uh, in the day. So if we give you four in the morning, uh, three or nothing later on, seems you are happy. That's just kind of sadly apply our uh, practice in ourselves sometimes in a society. We like to get it right now. Anything else? Later on, I use my credit card, or you know, <laughs> I don't care that. So, or for politicians, no, I need my sort benefit. I got a uh, uh, election next couple of months, so I can. How can I get a vote? That's my first priority. I don't care the for three piece or four piece. I give you five pieces. So. <clears throat> when I are you in charge of the power, then talk about it later. So then you then if this is another example. I think about the pandemic and uh, European conflict now happened. So for pandemic, so who is ourselves? If we do the if everyone ideally we do the same action, one month we we done with this. We can control ideally. However, no. If I'm calling, that's my life, my body, no vaccine. Uh, I don't even care the mask. So that's what's happened in Italy. And another one is in the um, European, who is, who is right, who is wrong. Eventually, everybody suffers. That's like, okay, initially you got like a year ago, you got a, uh, five or seven pieces. Later on, okay, I got two. Now I want to five pieces. I want seven pieces. Eventually, everyone we lost some pieces. At least lower the herd. I guess price our food supply chain. Hard herd. It's right refugees. Then how about refugee affect the local life? No one happy with those people. The refugees life not happy like you stay your own home. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, you know, I, that's why. I, well, first of all, I just love the image of the monkeys. But when you think about it, uh, as I think you're pointing out too, that you might say, oh, these dumb monkeys, they can't even tell the difference between you know, three in the morning and four at night, or four in the morning and three at night. But uh, when you think about it, are we really much smarter? You know, it's kind of like, let's say, one's employer say, oh, you know, I'm going to cut your pay, but you, uh, you can work less. Uh, the workers might get angry. And then say, OK, OK, fine, fine. I'll give you a promotion then. And then you wind up working a lot more. So is that different from the story? <laughs> well, like you said, you know, the loan. You buy something, the bank says, oh, I lend you money. Oh, that's so great. But with the interest at the end of the, the term, right, you're, 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 you're actually paying a lot more at the end. But it's your choice. Alex. Yeah, I'm trying to tie in um, Jason's um, uh, point out the sage harmonized right and wrong. How, what do you think that referring to the story? Because it, even though you know they want four pieces in the morning, three pieces in the afternoon, but is there right or wrong in the story? It just seems like the monkey is just trying to behave the, you know, the, the way they are. And uh, where's the right and wrong? What, where do you think is the right and wrong in the story? And, and when a sage harmonizes right and wrong, uh, rests on the scale of Tian, it's also pretty um, 
vague, you know. Um, I guess I guess the sage, if if, if a good king could, you know, uh, could harmonize. I wouldn't say right or wrong. We say harmonize everyone's opinions. Then it will achieve some sort of harmony. Um, but I don't see the right. Do you think there's a right and wrong in this story, or? I think that's a point. There is no right or wrong. So the sage, uh, the sage, doesn't see it as right or wrong. It, it's harmonized. That it's right or wrong just coexist. They're just they're both right. Uh, that's my interpretation. Yeah. But I do agree, this last part is very hard to understand. Yeah. Well, at least the monkey thinks that it was wrong <laughs> to get through these, <laughs> only through well, pieces. Well, no, I think what John is saying is that a lot of things in life, there's actually no real difference, but it's, we, we have emotional reactions as though there's a right or wrong, but there really right. isn't. Right. Uh, Madeline. All right, uh, this may be a little <clears throat> off course here. Um, I'm looking at the sentence that says, the name and substance did not wane, yet the happiness 